If we're honest with ourselves, and as artists, I think we have to be honest with ourselves, we know that the biggest TV star of the last year is Donald Trump. Yeah. No, I mean, I like it. He's the biggest star. You know, and Alec Baldwin, obviously. You know. You guys are neck and neck. And Alec, you're up against a lot of neck. And however you feel about the president, and you do feel about the president, you can't deny that every show was influenced by Donald Trump in some way. All the late night shows, obviously. House of Cards, the new season of American Horror Story, and of course, next year's Latin Grammys, hosted by Sheriff Joe Arpaio. (laughs) Muy caliente. And we all know the Emmys mean a lot to Donald Trump because he was nominated multiple times for Celebrity Apprentice, but he never won. Why didn't you give him an Emmy? I tell you this, if he had won an Emmy, I bet he wouldn't have run for president. So in a way, this is all your fault. Why, why, I thought you people loved morally compromised anti-heroes. You like Walter White. He's just Walter much wider. And even during the campaign, Trump would not let it go. This actually happened. This exchange actually happened in the debates. Uh, There was even a time when he didn't get an Emmy for his TV program three years in a row. And he started tweeting that the Emmys were rigged. He should have gotten it. This. (laughs) But he didn't. Because unlike the presidency, Emmys go to the winner of the popular vote. Where where do I find the courage to tell that joke in this room? But most of all, I have to thank Winston Churchill. Uh, In these crazy times, his life, even as an old man, reminds us what courage and leadership in government really looks like. Thank you. I want to, on a very personal note, I want to say thank you to Hillary Clinton for your grace and grit. I suppose I should say, at long last, Mr. President, here is your Emmy. I want to thank my wife. Uh, My wife and I had three children in three years, and we didn't have a child last year during the SNL season. I wonder if there's a correlation there. All you men out there, you put that orange wig on, it's birth control, trust me. Um, I have been waiting for a nine-to-five reunion ever since we did the first one. Well? Yeah, well, back in 1980 in that movie, we refused to be controlled by a sexist, egotistical, lying, hypocritical bigot. And in in 2017, we still refuse to be controlled by a sexist, egotistical, lying, hypocritical bigot. The next nominated programs celebrate culinary wizards, fantastic designers, beautiful people who rock the runway, and incredible talents with amazing voices. They also celebrate people who frantically race across international borders, and those who can scale walls really, really quickly. In other words, the president's worst nightmare. I want to thank Trump for making black people number one on the most oppressed list. <laughs> He's the reason I'm probably up here. We have a great final season that we're about to start filming with a lot of surprises that our fabulous writers have cooked up. We did have a whole storyline about an impeachment, but we abandoned that because we were worried that someone else might get to it first. Um, Uh, I want to thank um, everyone at HBO. Please wrap it up, really. All right, Richard Plappler, Casey Bloys, Amy Gravitt. Uh, the, The shows that, the other shows that just truly inspire us, um, uh, the uh, Atlanta, Blackish, Masters of None, the Trump White House, Modern Family, Kimmy Schmidt, um, Silicon Valley, Alec Berg, I owe you a thousand dollars. You heard, yeah, can you put my mic on? Thank you. That was the madness that you heard over at the Emmy. You know, I'm going to tell you something. I don't care about these people, and apparently, nor does anybody else. I'm only playing it for you so you get a, a taste and a feel for what vitriol and hatred just exists out there for this president it's like nothing i've ever seen and it's and it's you notice it's all basically based on the same false narrative and lies that the left tells about conservatives and have always told about conservatives well it didn't help them out we have the numbers are in the non-stop trump bashing fest you know that audience is that audience is for them it's 
uh, you know, you know, when are we going to have an award show for doctors and that save lives and nurses that comfort people and save lives? When are we going to have for great surgeons for those in the pharmaceutical industry, much hated, that develop medicines that save people from dying from cancer? You know, when are we going to have when are we going to have it for the garbage men and women that literally take all our crap to a place to get it away from us and we don't have to burn it in our backyard? When are we going to have it for construction workers that build our homes and offices? When are we going to have it for bricklayers? When are we going to have it for plumbers? You like to go to the bathroom? Want to go back to the old days in a little outhouse and hang out there in the cold of winter? I'll be right back. I'm just got to run out there to the old outhouse. This is not okay. It's not okay. Um, we don't, there is never an award season. What about people that manufacture our cars on the on the line? What about good teachers? You know, non-union usually. Where are the good for the good teachers? And there are good union teachers, but you get my point. There's an unholy alliance with liberals and the Democrats and the teachers unions, and they're destroying any good idea in education. But there are good teachers. And I know a lot of teachers that don't want their hard-earned money, like a lot of union people that I know, don't want their hard-earned money going to one political party. And it happens all the time. Doesn't that happen with our union? I don't even want to get into it. We all have to be members of a union to work in a radio station in New York. Oh, you're all members, right? I think so. No? Just me? (laughs) I'm the only union member in here. You caved. We kept up the fight. It's not a matter of caving. You cannot go on the air without it. No, we're fighting the good fight. You caved. I did not cave. I'm not a caver. Um, Anyway, so the Emmy numbers are in. And anyway, Stephen Colbert was on track to slip below even the historic low of last year. And it doesn't surprise me. Just like with football. Football struggling again in the ratings this year. Because... People don't tune in to see people take a knee and and start their ridiculous political protesting. And uh, but, you know, everyone has the right to do it. But, you know, if I was a team owner, I would do what Robert Kraft did of the Patriots. I know I mentioned the Patriots and some of you bubble and fizz like alcohol and water and you just can't take it. Oh, the Patriots. Oh, I hate the Patriots. It's so, it's so good. I hate them. Well, you, you got to. You got to love Belichick and you got to love Brady. Admire their talent. They're certainly better than the Jets. The Jets have infuriated me. If they don't get their act together, it's just unwatchable. It was unwatchable this weekend. Uh, you're laughing, but the Giants are on Monday Night Football. Yeah, I'm laughing because the, Jet, the Jets could very well be 0 16. They could be 0 and 16. They're okay, that they're bad. Not, then, uh, there's got to be somebody they could beat. There's got to be somebody. Maybe, maybe the maybe. Buffalo Bills. Maybe. <sighs> Didn't they play them in week one? Yeah, and they lost. And they lost. Okay. They, well, a lot of hope for that match. When do they play New England? <laughs> That's They've always played New England tough. That's the irony of it all. I don't know if this year is going to count. All right, but, but I digress. People love this country instinctively people do not like to see the institutions of the country torn down repeatedly and that's what we see on display you know people love america's history nobody's going to sit here and argue that america didn't have its original sins and america's ever been a perfect society or a perfect place it does not exist it never has existed that is not the human condition And the human condition has always been a struggle between good and between evil. You know, all have sinned. What part of all don't we understand have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? The, um, you know, we got Newt Gingrich coming on today. We'll talk a little bit about this with him. Bill O'Reilly is going to join us, uh, his first interview with us since he left the Fox News Channel. And one of the things he, he points he makes in his new book is that, you know, when they t- or he made in an interview, I was reading about it before I, I came in here, is that all this talk about tearing down Christopher Columbus now in Columbus Square in New York City. And they've set up a commission in New York City under Comrade de Blasio to look at every single solitary monument. And you've got to ask yourself, when is this ever going to end? But if they go after every framer and every founder of this country, what are they really going at? They want to tear the Constitution apart and say, well, it was founded by a bunch of racist people. You know, as imperfect as all of those men were, and they were all imperfect, they also were genius 
because they set up a system of self-governance with the principles that were endowed by our creator and that we're best to govern ourselves and and a constitution and a system that is put in place where you can correct wrongs and injustices that human goodness will transcend human evil and that was the beauty of our founders and framers and now over the course of history through the prism of history they have been proven correct what do you think when america albeit fights a civil war when america has a battle over voting rights and a battle over civil rights and you see that we err on the side of goodness almost every time the right side wins and we become a more perfect union, imperfect as we are. Want to know what's imperfect? Look at what happened in Chicago this weekend. It was an unmitigated disaster. And then we've got, what, 80 arrested in St. Louis, third night of violence there. I mean, what I saw this weekend, 29 people were injured this weekend in in Chicago. Ten people killed, 29 wounded in shootings just in one city. That's human evil. I've talked a lot about human evil on this program. Um, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to invite Bill O'Reilly on the program, we were not that close when he was on the Fox News channel. And one reason, we didn't really see each other a whole lot. And I guess it's sort of the competitive nature of our business. And since he, uh, since he got fired from Fox, we just started talking. And over the course of time, we realized we had a lot more in common than we probably ever realized. And uh, Bill O'Reilly, I think, is a victim in many ways of this um, this liberal effort to silence every conservative voice. I've never called for a boycott of any liberal or a firing of any liberal in my career. And they've done some outrageous things. They've had outrageous conduct. I didn't even call for the firing of Kathy Griffin at CNN with the ISIS pose severed head or any of the things that have been said about Donald Trump. But we now have gotten to a point, if you're a conservative on radio and television anymore, you've got millions of dollars flowing to these organizations with the distinct purpose that they monitor every word, every sentence, every phrase, and do everything possible so that they can get conservatives fired. They go after their advertisers over nothing. And if we're going to have freedom of speech in this society and a free and open exchange of ideas and ideals and opinions, we've got to let the viewers decide. We've got to, if I don't want to watch a program, I don't watch a program. There's a lot of, I didn't watch the Emmys last night. I had better things to do. I was sewing or something. I was doing something better than that. I don't sell, but I'm just making a point. Breaking news ah, now. Shut up. All right, enough of you people laughing in there. I did it for your own entertainment purposes, so you know. I still continue. All right, so I have insomnia, but I've never slept better. And what's changed? Just a pillow. It's had such a positive impact on my life. And, of course, I'm talking about my pillow. I fall asleep faster. I stay asleep longer. And now you can, too. Just go to MyPillow.com or call 800-919-6090. Use the promo code Hannity. And Mike Lindell, the inventor of MyPillow, has the special four-pack. Now, you get 40% off two MyPillow premiums and two Go Anywhere pillows. Now, MyPillow is made here in the USA, has a 60-day unconditional money-back guarantee and a 10-year warranty. Go to MyPillow.com right now or call 800-919-6090, promo code Hannity, to get Mike Lindell's special four-pack offer. You get two MyPillow premium pillows and two go-anywhere pillows for 40% off. And that means once those pillows arrive, you start getting the kind of peaceful and restful and comfortable and deep healing and recuperative sleep that you've been craving and you certainly deserve. MyPillow.com, promo code Hannity. You will love this pillow. I mean, if any of you did half the stuff she did, I promise you, you'd be in jail. I promise if you were in Arizona, you would be in jail. Nobody would get away with the things she's getting away with. And now she's saying she might contest the election, depending on the Russia, how Russiagate turns out. Yeah, good luck with that. I'm sure that's not going to do anything. You know, I wanted a poll, but I just don't have time for it. Obama now is cashing in on Wall Street. Gave a speech for $400,000. four hundred thousand dollars. Four hundred. I know. What are you saying? Wait, I can't read lips. You got to put your mic on. What? I said, damn. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Okay. He's with the people. But what about all the? Well, no. What about all the times we heard that Wall Street's evil? Wall Street's horrible. 
I'm not particularly fond of what goes on at Wall Street. I actually have. That's not what he says. He's against capitalism, except for when it benefits him. Of course. That's the point. There's such hypocrites. And when he only gets 200,000 of the 400,000, maybe he'll realize, oh, wait a minute, we need tax cuts for the rich. I wonder how much he's going to donate to the victims of Hurricane Harvey and Irma. Yeah, I wonder if he's done anything. There were 80 people arrested. Do you, you see all this violence in St. Louis over the weekend? Absolutely unbelievable. You know, damaging property, spraying unknown substances on police officers. One cop suffered a leg injury and was taken to the hospital. And after ignoring calls to disperse, the arrests were made before midnight by officers wearing riot gear. We saw all of this beginning to emerge on on Friday night when we were on the air. Um, so we'll get to that. Diane Feinstein today, this is pretty good, big news that nobody paid any attention to, says there was no evidence that Jared Kushner colluded with any Russians. You know what you're going to find out on Russia that you've been lied to? I know you want me to talk about Drudge. I'm on, yes, I am on the front cover of Drudge. I see that. It's a it's very nice right. picture. I have five computers in front of me. How could I not see? If you see? are looking at Drudge right now, America, call in to 800-941-SEAN and tell us what you think about Sean moving to 9 o'clock. All right. Well, that's what I read. Nobody told me any of the details. I'm here to claim in my time. All right, we claim we just said in my it. time. We've got Newt Gingrich, Bill O'Reilly. We've got Tom Fitton. He's got some of the new Hillary Clinton emails. All right, 25 till the top of the hour, 800 Sean, you want to be a part of the program, and we'll get to some of your calls this half hour, I promise. Uh, one thing I did want to get to is, yes, we have another hurricane on the way. I don't know what it is about Joe Bastardi, official weather guy for the Sean Hannity Show. Last two hurricanes have a track going directly from home number one and condo number two. Is that basically what we're talking about here? No, you're going to be all right. You're just going to have a nor'easter. At, uh, at it's your, so easy uh, for you to say, nah, I don't think it'll knock the whole house down on your head, Hannity. No, you're, you're Certainly going, God yeah, is sending a message to me. <laughs> I have one little well, condo, people, and I have a, I, a house, and they're hurric- back-to-back hurricanes in different locations. They get hit head yeah. on. Well, we, we, we knew Jose was going to try to come up the East Coast, but it's going to be weakening as it gets closer and it, it is a nor'easter, and a summer nor'easter is a pain in the neck because you have a lot of leaves on trees, and uh, sometimes the branches break a little bit quicker than that. But I think that uh, most places will say, well, what was the big deal? Because Jose is going to be turning out before it makes landfall, and it's going to be weakening as it uh, comes towards southern New England. And then it's going to turn very sharply to the right, about 100 miles south of the New England coast. So I don't think it's anything that we haven't seen before as far as uh, the kind of storms we get on Long Island, New England, and Cape Cod. Uh, it's just that it's occurring, and it's got a name on it, and it is a feature that originated in the tropics. Now, Maria is a full-fledged beast and will be the worst storm on Puerto Rico since Hugo in 1989 and maybe worse than what Hugo was. Hugo came across the extreme east part of Puerto Rico. This is going to make a direct hit, I think, on the island and could be a Category 4 when it does it. And then uh, it, its path is south of Irma. Irma went through the islands to the east and then went 60 to 100 miles north of San Juan. This one's coming right across the island and right on the north coast of the Dominican Republic. And that resort there, uh, well, I guess it's Punta Cana, I think it goes north of them, but uh, they're going to get a significant storm out of this, as is the north coast of the Dominican Republic. I don't think Santa Domingo is going to get it that bad. And then it gets into the Turks and Caicos in about four or five days, and that's when we have to really start looking at didn't it. They get, didn't they get whacked before? They already got hit. Yeah, and uh, I think that this is not going to be as, quite as bad as Irma on the Turks and Caicos because I think it may be – I don't think it's going to directly come across. It may be just to the east and north of them. Am but, I gonna, are you going to become like a permanent co-host on this show? Are we going to have to have you on every day to talk about a hurricane, or is this just hurricane season? Well, we got, I think there's going to be another two to three. We, I'm going to tell you, I'm seeing the end game of this whole season now. And, uh, no. again, you know, the, uh, our weatherbell.com preseason forecast, you can, we had a red cone right from where these hurricanes are coming from, sprayed at the United States this year, saying this is the year, folks. I want you to understand something. The weather's a movie. It's not a snapshot. People will snow, tell you the snapshots. They'll show you the snapshots. This is because this is happening. You could see this setting up. You could see that this was going to be a big impact year. And so uh, it's a kind of thing that we saw in the 40s and 50s. 
And by the way, this is this is an extreme event here. Two two of these monster hurricanes this close to Puerto Rico. But when you consider it's been 28 years since a, a major of these categories, Hugo, Category 4, impacted Puerto Rico like this. You go 28 years without a major hurricane in that area, or a hurricane of this stature, you would think that, well, guess what? This is what happens. In 1954, we had Edna and Carol hit back-to-back in New England, two major hurricanes, and that was in New England, Connie and Diane in 55 in North Carolina. So there is precedent for these things clustering in a certain area, and that's what you're seeing. It's not completely gone, but it's not the type of beast that is going to burden Puerto Rico. And it may, uh, the Rio may be, may be something in a few days that we have to start worrying about on the East Coast, but not Florida. I don't think it's coming from Florida. All right. Thank you, WeatherBell.com's Joe Bastardi on the Sean Hannity Show, 800-941-SEAN, our number you want to be a part of the program, uh, Newt Gingrich and Bill O'Reilly will be joining us today. And John Rich is checking in, and Tom Fitton is going to join us as well. Um, pretty amazing. You know, these are all pay-to-play examples. How is it possible after all this time we're still finding Hillary Clinton emails? How is it even po- And they were at the State Department the whole time. And the only reason we found it is because of the Freedom of Information Act request through Judicial Watch. And I'm sitting here, I'm like... Anybody else that did this would be arrested, put in jail, and that would be the end of it. That's called obstruction of justice. You don't get to delete 33,000 emails that are under subpoena. Did you wipe the server? What, like with a cloth or something? No. I mean, how much more do some people need to get to the truth in all of this? As examples of pay to play, you'll find the very people donate to the Clinton Foundation. They go to this guy, Doug Band, who was running the foundation, one of the top people. Doug Band goes to Uma Abedin, and more than half the people Hillary sees as Secretary of State are the top donors, and that means the hell with the little people. Pretty outrageous, but we'll give you all the details. That's coming up in the course of the program today. You better keep an eye. I'm just warning everybody on North Korea. North Korea, this guy keeps firing missiles. It's not if, it's when. There's going to be a major military conflict with North Korea. And as I've been saying, there are not good options. Now, we're going to win. But it's a matter of how much damage is going to have to be done And what this guy is capable of in terms of firing at South Korea and Seoul and maybe Japan and maybe Guam and maybe China. Who knows how nuts this guy is? But certainly appeasement didn't work. Bill Clinton's assurance is a good deal for the American people. We're going to give them billions of dollars. We'll give them energy. They got to keep their nuclear fuel but we promise they're not going to do anything with it. Never, ever, 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 ever. You know, well, here we go. It's the same thing. And we're going to be debating the very same issues involving Iran down the line. And it's only a matter of time. It's really only a matter of time. Um, when I'm done with the radio program today, I'm going to interview the president of Egypt, General al-Sisi. I got questions. I've read all the interviews that he's done. I've got questions nobody has ever asked him. Now, he very courageously has taken on the radical elements in Islam, and he's saying that we need a reformation here. And I just want to see how far he's willing to go with that. And so it's a hard interview to do, and we can't air it tonight because we've got an interpreter. So it takes time to actually make it viewable for you, the, the viewers, and then we'll have Hannity tonight at 10. Anyway, Nikki Haley actually said what I've been saying. And she's warning Kim Jong-un, you better cut it out or North Korea is going to be destroyed. Well, the problem is if we take out on the launch pad or we take out of the sky any of the the missiles that they're test firing over Japan or if they ever dare to shoot one at Guam, if they go to Guam, it's it's basically a declaration of war. And Trump is going to fire and he's not going to stop. And at that point, what's he going to do next? Does he go to South Korea? And if he does, we're going to have to take out his nuclear sites. And then you have to worry about, well, will he launch a nuke because we're taking out his nuclear sites? Has he moved any nuclear capability to an area we don't know about and he's going to fire at South Korea or Japan? Who knows? But at that point, what's the nuclear fallout aspect of this, the radiation fallout? What does it mean? How many are going to die in 
in Seoul in South Korea. It's beyond scary. But that, you have no option. Once you give these dictators weapons of mass destruction, they're not rolling by the same rules as the rest of the world rolls on. North Korean fuel prices are soaring as now U.N. sanctions are kicking. And by the way, you can't even get around New York. I had to walk halfway to work today once I got in the city um, because you just can't move. Did you see me come in with a nice sweat on my brow today? You think it was you all will laugh. Why was that so funny to all of you? Cause, no, because you didn't listen. I tried to tell you at 10 o'clock this morning. I was like, listen. I left. I had my, Well, I'm not giving up my ninja lesson just to get in here early because the U.N. is here and they block every street. First of all, it's blocked off so far away from the U.N. <laughs> it makes no sense. We're on, this is like all the way in the middle of the city. There's no reason for it. Okay. Anyway, there's been some military efforts over the weekend and a warning to Pyongyang, B-1... Uh, B bombers and F-35s have been holding mock bombing drills, and the Korean Peninsula is now drawing a range of military drills in a show of force against uh, North Korea. So I'm not sure how that is going to end. All right, this is how bad hatred for Donald Trump is. Did you remember we told the story and I showed it last Friday night on TV? Probably one of the greatest feel-good stories of the year. So Sarah Sanders, Huckabee Sanders, but she dropped the Huckabee. So Sarah Sanders, who was the White House press secretary, she actually reads a letter from a, an 11 year old kid from Virginia. And this kid has a, a lawn mowing business. And he says he'd love to help cut the lawn of the president. So they invited him to have the honor to do that. Well, now liberals newest attack on Trump is he let the kid mow the lawn of the White House, which he asked to do. And the president comes out and meets the young man and the president shakes his hand. The president brings him in the Oval Office and the president brings him in, I think, to a cabinet meeting. And the kid has, you know, memories now of a lifetime. I was 11 years old. I cut the White House grass and I got to meet the president and vice president of the United States. Well, apparently liberals are very upset about that. He started his own lawn care business. I'm sh- you know what? You know what's going to happen? He admit it's admitted now that he started his own lawn care business. That's really dangerous for this poor kid, because now the IRS will be coming after him. I expect a letter in the morning. Lois Lerner, I'm sure if she was still there, would be all over that. We can get the $3.50 you know, per yard that this poor kid you know, cuts. And people, oh, it's dangerous. Oh, what did he do? The kid cuts lawns for a living. And he doesn't like the president being attacked. Did you? any of you in there watch the Emmys last night? Anyone? You watch it? Jason, you watch a little bit? I was in and out. What did you think? You were watching football. I know you. Yeah, I mean, it was. it is what it is. I, I rarely ever watch these things, but when I saw that Colbert was attacking Trump mercilessly, I I knew I had to watch it. You knew you had. You wanted to watch it? Of course, it. for the sake of the show. For the it's sake about of the, the show. show. It's all about the show. I know it's about the show. Should I talk about the headline on Drudge now, or should I wait till later? What do you want to talk about? I think about? we should talk about it now. I'm not. I'll let you talk about it, and then I'm thinking about. You want to give me an open mic again? Your mic is open. <gasps> dun, 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 dun. Just for this portion of the Sean Hannity show. <laughs> <laughs> that, is not a, that is not an open mic invitation for any when other. You're on my time. I exactly. can reclaim it. You can reclaim. Well, technically, that's what you've done. You've reclaiming my time. You reclaimed your time. Reclaiming my time. I'm reclaiming my time. What are you talking about? Maxine Water should do the intro to your to your yeah. new time. It should be great because you're reclaiming it back. I don't. I didn't get a copy of the press release, so I don't know if they announced the. Who date. needs a press release when you've got friends to tell your well, story? Who needs a press release when the Drudge Report has it? once Drudge has it, the whole entire world has it. That's this just is very a fact. true. And they have a nice picture of me. Up it's there. a very nice picture. Here's the headline: News Battle Royale, Hannity to take on Maddow. That's not a fair fight. Well, I mean, she beat. Everybody in the month of August. And I came in second. And I'm going to tell you what's happening in cable news. It apparently conspiracy TV works. And, you know, you know what's amazing about it is she had like zero ratings forever. But she has found a core of Trump haters in this country, like hating on the poor kid that cut the lawn. And um, so we'll be moving back to nine o'clock. I'm not sure the exact da- the exact date yet. Did they put the date on yet? So anybody can we put know, it on my we calendar. Know, we know it's next week. It was, you know, or the week after. We're not exactly sure. But no. now they're making us wait. Originally, well, we says, thought it was this week. It says October 30th. I didn't see the press release. Nobody asked me about, you know, I, I was asked briefly about the press release, gave a comment. Isn't that mischief night? <laughs> You're going to start on Mischief Night? I don't, what is... Oh, here it is. Wait a minute. I just got it, actually. 
Breaking news it just came now. in. All right, the headline is Laura Ingram. Why did she get top billing in this thing? She's new. Ladies first. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I'm teasing, of course. Uh, Laura Ingram to host the Ingram Angle weeknights at 10 on the Fox News Channel. Hannity moves to 9 p.m. and the five returns to 5 p.m. Fox News Channel is named Laura Ingram, the host of the Ingram Angle Show, a new live primetime program to debut on October the 30th. Uh, ahead of Ingram's debut, Hannity, hosted by Sean Hannity, will move to the 9 o'clock hour. Uh, the ensemble program, The Five, will move to 5 p.m., while the 10 p.m. hour will be helmed by rotating hosts during the interim period. Each of these changes will take place on September the 25th. That's next Monday. So I guess we're starting next Monday? I don't know. I think I like Mischief Night. I'm, I'm going for that. I think people should stay tuned. All right. Suzanne Scott said in the announcement, we are delighted to unveil... This new primetime schedule for both our current and future generation of loyal Fox News fans. But you know what? That's a nice way of saying I'm like the bridge between two generations of the Fox News channel. I was there in the beginning. I'm still hanging out in the middle. And apparently I'm there to the bitter end. If it ain't broke, don't that's actually a good way to put it. I mean, in many ways, we've lost our entire. We lost Greta, Bill, Megan. Everybody's gone. I mean, I'm the only who. No, I never would have believed on the last one standing. I'm the last person to believe it. Me, I think me, Cavuto, and John Scott are the three originals that are still on the network. And Steve, and I think Steve as well. Anyway, um, we'll talk more about it. I have a lot to say about this at a future date this week. But I'm not going to talk about it now. If you want to read the story, it's up on the Drudge Report. Um, You know... Every, by the way, everybody in the media wants me to lose. Because, look, she's been on fire. So I'm, I'm starting out like I have all of my career, the underdog. I'm not in first place. I'm in second place. And I'm starting out in second place. It took Matt out like nine years. But the media will give me one night. And if I don't win the first night, Hannity sucks. And, uh, but that's not how cable rolls. Because we're in this for the long, we're in this for the long haul. Let's just put it this way. The world's going to be very aware of what's been going on over there at Conspiracy TV. Well, it ends in a record low number of viewers, which I don't think is going to surprise anybody here. Uh, 800-941-SEAN is our toll-free telephone number. We welcome back to the program. He's been on another extended vacation. God only knows where he was this time. I think last time he was hanging out with penguins and and, and polar bears. Newt Gingrich. No. What? Sean. Yes. No, 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 no. I went went to Kiev (laughs) for a security conference talking about the Russian effort in eastern Ukraine and and, uh, the Crimea. I was working hard. I was diligent. I did not see a single penguin. And how many how many speeches did you give and how long were you there? Uh, Actually, I went back and forth. I left Wednesday night, got back Saturday night and gave four speeches. Yeah, but you've been gone longer than that. I guess you might. Maybe we just took some time. I haven't been gone longer than that. I did your show. I, Last the, week, all the, day, all the days go together. I was the guy with gray hair that was on your show. <laughs> I'm getting close, by the way. <laughs> just look at the Drudge Report today. Uh, um, uh, all right, well, let me start with, look, it's, it, there, there is this hatred that is cultural now. Right. And the left, and there's an audience for it. I mean, they just announced that Hannity is going, I'm moving back to my old time slot, and you got this woman that spins conspiracy theories on MSNBC, and tells lies every night. And I guess conspiracy theory, quote, news, which isn't news at all, uh, is apparently attractive to a lot of people that just hate this president. This is it's like a I, don't, I think the sight of Trump is like a Pavlovian conditioning for them. Oh, I think they wake up every morning and I don't know how much he does this deliberately, but I think when he tweets in the morning. He reminds all of the people who hate him that he's still president, and it just makes their breakfast miserable. I mean, they're sitting there, they can't eat, their stomach is upset, they're getting a headache, and they're thinking, oh, my God, it's still true. The nightmare's not over. These people have never recovered uh, from election night when they knew Hillary was going to win. And, of course, she hasn't recovered either, so they have kind of a nice balanced commitment to being out of touch with reality. But the other thing that this is much deeper than just personality, and as you know, this is why I I did my new course on Defending America, is that you have a base on the left 
that deeply dislikes America, wants to eliminate it, wants to eliminate the Constitution, wants to move, you know, wants, wants to basically be create a new racism uh, and, and wants to do so on behalf of left-wing values. So uh, it is amazing to me how we have allowed purely racist language on the left, particularly uh, African-Americans who use racist phrases over and over again, uh, and we tolerate it. I mean, this was everything the civil rights movement was fighting has now come full circle. Uh, and instead of white racists, you end up with black racists saying things that are horrifying. Uh, and and you you have students now who are being told, we're going to have a day where no whites are allowed on campus. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, this is part of a larger left-wing assault on America as a culture. And it's part of the whole notion that America is essentially a bad country, which has been run by bad people. Uh, and somehow we have to profoundly change it. Uh, and, and that's why you end up with Antifa. And you end up with this whole effort, both in the entertainment media, in the news media, and on college campuses. And, you know, and, uh, I have Bill O'Reilly. Riley, coalition. I have Bill O'Reilly on in the next half hour, and one of the premises in his book is he's got a new book out, Killing England, The Brutal Struggle for American Independence, and I heard some comments that he made, and he's basically making the point that if they can destroy the history of this country and all these monuments and what they represent, you know, obviously not factoring in the human experience as one of imperfection and, and human beings battling between good and evil and the struggle of the human soul, uh, and out of their imperfection, they still created a system that writes wrongs and create and corrects injustices, that ultimately the goal is to say, well, the Constitution is racist and America was founded on racism. Therefore, we need a new society and a new Constitution. Well, and this is very so close to the radicalism of the French Revolution. Every once in a while you get these very, very intense patterns uh, that, that build up uh, in which people come along and decide they're going to erase everything. They're going to somehow, you know, and you get, you get a little bit of it with Bernie Sanders uh, and his eagerness to create socialism in America, it, neglecting the results in Venezuela, the results in Cuba, the results in Zimbabwe, uh, the results in the British national health system, which has a huge crisis underway. Uh, just once again willing to go and do something that plain doesn't work. It just goes against uh, human nature. But, but, but folks who are interested that they want to go to um, defendingamericacourse.com, we laid out there the arguments. And, and the reason I did it is you and I have been talking about this for months. Our folks, the folks who love America, care about America, and want to take on the left and win the argument, prove that America is worthy of our, our support, our defense, our paying attention. I think what, what I'm trying to do in a series of six uh, lectures in this, this short course on defending America is I'm trying to lay out for them, here's how to defend the right to bear arms. Here's how to defend religious liberty. Mm-hmm. Here's how to defend American uniqueness. You know, if we don't do that, I mean, I can never, Barry Farber used to always say that there's never in the history of, been, of man been a country that has accumulated more power, more might than the United States of America and abused it less and used it more for the good than any other country, any other state, if you will, in history. I want to talk about the agenda now in Congress. Lindsey Graham, I'm told I spent a lot of time on the phone this weekend. Lindsey Graham thinks he's about one vote away in the Senate from his proposal, which would send health care back to the states. And if California wants to choose Obamacare they, and New York wants to choose it and Illinois wants to choose it, they can choose it. But they're going to buy it and own it, and it's their problem, and they will do what they think is in the best interest of the people of those states. But if red states, if Georgia, if Florida, if Alabama and any Ohio or, or Michigan, if they want to do it differently, they can. Um, as a conservative, we often believe you know, we want to get away with this issue, this whole big concept of federalism, and we'd rather send things back to the states because they tend to manage things a lot better than a Washington bureaucracy. Good idea, bad idea? No, it's basically a good idea. Look, the, the fact is that we have proven decisively for the last 30 years that Washington cannot run the health system. It gets more and more expensive. It gets harder and harder to access, uh, and it gets more and more bureaucratic and spends more of its time and money on red tape. So in that sense, trying to find a way for the 50 states to have more creativity is important. I mean, my my only practical advice to Lindsay and his friends is make sure you get the pledges in writing. Uh, remember, they thought they had John McCain's vote up to about two hours before the vote. 
Uh, so you can't, as a guy who used to be the Republican whip in the House, you can't just rely on people to pat you on the shoulder and say it's really a big idea. A big idea is not the same as yes. Uh, and, so, and and given the current tension, I wouldn't even accept yes verbally. I'd say that's great. Uh, how about sending me a letter pledging to vote for it? Uh, because I think what they don't want to do is come down to one more round of getting 49 votes. I and mean, I think that would be very debilitating. I think it would be debilitating, but I also talk to members in the House, and they tend to like the idea as well. And well, I, I think it may it may pass the House. I originally was skeptical. But I am told there's a very high likelihood. Very that high likelihood. Pass the Senate, it'll pass the House. It'll pass the House, and they'll get it done, and they'll still be able to use reconciliation. You know, of course, the devil's always in the details, especially when you're dealing with Washington and how much money they're going to pour into this thing. How important is that they get you? You, we both agree on this. Keep it simple, stupid. And the tax bill. I was told by some House leadership that they can't use the reconciliation process on the tax reform bill if it's less than 20 percent. That's what I was told. Is that true? I don't know whether that would be true. Okay. I mean, I, 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 I think it may be an argument about whether or not uh, it pays for itself in the second 10 years under the Bird Rule. But my argument is have directed scoring. Yeah, I would just agree run, with that, just, too. Just run over the system. Do not allow stupid ideas and rules to block you from doing something intelligent. Will you please tell that to the leadership in the House and Senate, please? I think I just did. And what about McConnell? Does he need to get rid of the supermajority once and for all? Well, I'll tell you, he's taking another significant step, I think, in the next couple of days. With judges. And that Mitch Mitch has indicated that they're going to dramatically weaken the ability of individual senators to block judges. Uh, And Mitch has been very focused. I know conservatives have a lot of arguments with him, but he has been very focused on getting conservative judges in. And there's a pretty good chance that in Trump's first term, he will appoint more conservative judges than Reagan did in eight years. Uh, And I think that... uh, you know, McConnell's indicated he's not going to tolerate people like Al Franken holding up a judge uh, forever and having, in effect, a one-person veto. We still and that's have a real change in the Senate rules. There are 265 bills that have been passed in the House they haven't taken up in the Senate, and then you have all these Trump appointments. I mean, they haven't they haven't appointed a third. They haven't had a vote on a, an appointment of a third of the president's appointees. That to me is ridiculous. Well, and I think they're going to have to play catch up in the next few weeks. And my prediction is you'll see an amazing number of those bills pass uh, by unanimous consent because that's part of the way the Senate operates, is that it builds up and it builds up, and then suddenly it's like the logjam breaking. And again, I was Speaker of the House. I wasn't, I never served in the Senate. But having watched it for many years, that's the process that just, it's the nature of that particular building. But I do think both uh, McConnell and Ryan have an obligation. In particular, as you know, I'm fixated on the tax cut. I think the tax cut is the essence of making making sure we have a good enough economy for the 2018 election. And that, that's my biggest single concern. I think we're making progress on a number of fronts, but they have to get a tax cut signed into law by uh, the uh, by Thanksgiving, I think, in order to have effect in the first quarter. Well, I'm told that October will be the House and that November will be the Senate. And you're right, they got to get it done. All right, got to take a quick break. We'll come back more with Newt Gingrich on the other side at the bottom of the half hour. Bill O'Reilly, his first uh, interview appearance with us in a long time. And since he left the Fox News Channel, all right? 800-941-SEAN is a toll-free telephone number. You want to be a part of the program. I want to ask you about last week and DACA and the president. I made a very strong case on radio and TV that if the president ever concedes on the issue of DACA and doesn't get the wall funding, he's never going to get it because we always get the tax increase, never the spending cuts. You always get the compromise, but you never get the wall built. Well, my, and I'm talking to the White House directly, uh, they absolutely are determined they want to get the wall built. And I think uh, that they are going to get, they will get substantial funding uh, that will go towards the wall. Now, you may want to call it a fence rather than a wall. But they're going to get funding to be able to put up uh, further blocking of people coming into the United States. Uh, and, and, and I think it's interesting. I, I said on, on TV yesterday, it fascinates me that the Democrats hate the wall more than they love the Dreamers. That's such so a good Democrats are willing to sacrifice all of these young people on their ideological principle of no wall. That's such a I mean, great way to put it. They hate the wall more than they do the dreamers, which they say they love so much. That's right. I mean, if they had any concern at all for the human beings involved, they'd say, fine, here's the money for the wall. 
let's let's find a way to legalize. Remember, the goal here was to not have to deport people who came to the U.S. at an average age of six. Uh, and for the Democrats to turn their back on the Dreamers and say uh, and, and chant "No wall, no wall," just strikes me as crazy. And I hope that we will have enough honesty in the Latino community for people to start pointing out that it's the Democrats who are now causing the problem. If they, the president has said he's willing to sign the bill if they can get it done. If they did pull off the Graham health care bill, if they did pull off 15, 17, a much lower corporate rate, middle rate, uh, middle class tax cuts, repatriation uh, and the alternative minimum tax postcard returns. If they included in all of that energy jobs, I've got to believe and the end of the death tax that that would end the wall. Then I think they'd go a long way to not only keeping their majority in 2018, but building on it, especially in oh, the Senate. I think, I think in the Senate they'll gain six or eight seats if they if they do that. And that's the right kind of but, effort. Then to why make. did they make us wait a year for all this? Why do they always wait to the end to finally do something? Because it's the nature of the American constitutional system. It doesn't have to be this arduous and painful, does it? Short, short of a major war like World War II, uh, there are very few occasions when the U.S. Congress moves at the pace uh, the commentators would like. I'm, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck. I'm no, you're, saying, you're being a total smart ass. You really are. I'm you're being either. a. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to describe. This is why I, I'm teaching defendingamerica.com uh, or uh, defendingamericacourse.com because I want folks to be able to learn this is how a free society works. Well, it's gotta, I want to it's remind people. It's got to talk to itself. You know, I've spent a lot of time on this program explaining to all of you exactly what the conditions are if you're a conservative in the media today it, frankly if you even like donald trump you don't have to agree with him on everything if you like him you're a target and over the now I'm a, i've been on radio 30 years i'm going to start my 23rd year on fox the conditions under which we work if you're not part of the establishment media are pretty severe. Now, the reason I tell you is because we're under fire all the time, and these different groups that are funded by multi-multi-millionaires, they pay people to sit in their underwear in their basement all day. By the way, whoever you are, you are a loser in places like New Mexico. And they tape and monitor every single word, every sentence, every second that we are on the air in the hopes that a conservative will say one thing wrong, one phrase wrong, one sentence wrong, and they, they, the purpose is then we, can, then we can attack their advertisers. And they celebrate when they can bring a campaign to bring people down. It's never been this bad. And it's getting worse every day. And the amount of money that is being invested is in the millions and millions of dollars. Um, my fellow host over at the Fox News Channel, Bill O'Reilly, was the latest victim of this. And he joins us now to talk about this. He also has a brand new book out. He's launching today. It's called Killing England, The Brutal Struggle for American Independence. The cover is awesome. Bill, how are you? Good. Thanks for having me in, Sean. Uh, am I overstating this? Is that hyperbole on my part? No. Um, I think anybody who really wants to get an independent view of this, aside from you and me, should read Cheryl Atkinson's book, The Smear. Um, that book is so well researched and documented, and it will take the reader through this machine that the far left has developed to harm, and that's the word, harm, anyone with whom they disagree. So Cheryl nailed it, um, and I'm a victim of it, and you, um, to your credit, uh, when they got through with me and they trained their guns on you. By the way, two you, days after you were fired. Two right. days you after. You right to the folks. You're a lot smarter than I am, Hannity. All right, so you well. got that on tape now. <laughs> I should have done exactly the same thing. Wait a minute, did. wait a minute. Get that in a promo reel right now. We want to put that on a loop. <laughs> Bill O'Reilly saying I'm smarter than him. Well, um, you certainly, certainly handled it better than I did because you brought it to the folks. Well. And the folks knew it was BS. And now what I'm trying to do is expose the whole thing uh, along with you so that Americans know the danger. You know, I read this article. It was in Newsmax yesterday. It's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on. I'm also reading your new book, and I'm really enjoying it. And I think it's maybe one of your best killing books so far. And I know they've done very well, and they often get turned into movies. But um, so this article comes out in Newsmax about a 2015 arrest by the Detroit police about one of these accusers that was in part responsible for the boycott that ultimately led to your firing at Fox. And what it found out is pretty shocking because it's pretty detailed. Why don't you tell everybody what it is? 
All right. Well, uh, the article is posted, as you mentioned, on Newsmax.com and BillOReilly.com. And uh, one of these women who smeared me and was given um, a free pass by The View and quoted in every newspaper, um, totally fabricated. Never, I never saw the woman, never had a conversation with the woman, no idea who she is. Well, now we learn that she was arrested for filing a false police report in Detroit um, we have the police report in the article. Um, it's shocking. It's shocking. And not only that, but the phrases that she said, I said to her, again, a total fabrication, she used in tweets years ago the exact same phrases. So it's a stunning article. But you're not going to get the mainstream media to give it a lot of play, even though they ran with what she smeared me. No problem. Didn't vet her. Nobody looked into her background. And here we go. And this is just the first of many that we're going to have for uh, the American people. You have said that you have launched a significant investigation, investing a lot of resources into clearing your name. Where are you with that? Well, as I said, this is the first drop uh, that you're going to see. We're going to be very precise, and it's not going to be any he said, she said. Not going to be any of that. It's going to be facts, cold stone facts. And what we're going to uncover, because we've already we're already pretty well down this road, is shocking. That's the only word I can t- I could use. Shocking. And that they'll this be. Could happen yeah. in our republic that this kind of defamation and it's bought and paid for as you pointed out millions of dollars in play it's shocking i want to clear something up and this is a fact and it was widely reported um that when you were at the fox news channel and we were one of the both hired at the same time we went on in october 96 and what a lot of people didn't know is a we rarely saw each other and we kind of were a little bit competitors and at each other's throats but i will say this that since you left the channel you and i have started to have conversations and we realized i think that in many ways it was it was probably a mistake on both our parts to you know think that you were isolated on an island and i'm isolated on an island because i think what these groups very effectively do is is they target and isolate in very alinskyite fashion and so they'll go after you and they'll go after dr laura and they'll go after glenn beck and they'll go after don imus and they'll go after rush limbaugh and then two days after you were fired they went after me and it was a woman that had stalked me for 14 years smeared me lied about me for all those years and you can't do anything about it and you can't even sue because the person has no money nothing there's nothing to win and and then everybody in the media picks up what a what a stalker says and they run with it and then you're you're playing defense trying to defend your good name well you can't win because the media wants you silenced and they wanted me silenced that's the outcome that they want. So CNN, MSNBC, the newspapers, all that, they don't care whether it's true or not. Nobody's searching for the truth. Nobody. So whatever allegation is put out there becomes a fact. That's right. And, and, and so you're, you're left defending yourself against phantoms. As yep. I said, this woman who, who smeared me, I never spoke to this woman in my life. I don't even know who she is. I heard the case, and I didn't know this at the time, but I I found out subsequently that this woman that was in Los Angeles that, yeah, you did have a drink with her. Big deal. And that there oh, was that actually was ridiculous. There was there, there was, was so a time preposterous. There was a time stamp on the whole thing. That that was so preposterous. And this was the only one that they could come up with, the New York Times could come up with. All right, and and the and the woman says that um, oh, uh, he did something untoward. O'Reilly did something. And then after that, alleged, which never happened, okay, she was on my show for 15 weeks. No. All right? And then we analyzed the ratings. They weren't that great, so we didn't hire her as a contributor. Well, that was it. And then she said, can you help me with my book? To me, in an email to my assistant, I said, sure, because I'll help people out. I got her on The View, a national spot. You should, we have all the emails, all the documentation. Didn't matter. By the way, if it you can get, matter. if you the can get. The accusation is oh, what the mainstream media wants. If you can get me on The View, I think I'll pass, by the way. Thank you very much. I don't think anybody wants to go on that show anymore. 
Um, But this is really, I think we are at a crossroads. And here's the serious aspect of this. I have never been a believer in boycotts. I have never been out there calling for the firings. What I, for example, what happened at the Emmys last night was despicable. It was disgusting. It was disgraceful. And they paid for it with low ratings. But I'm not that person. It seems like conservatives now have become the more tolerant people in this country. And the ones, I call it liberal fascism. They want to shut down, silence any voice they don't agree with and they want a monopoly of all media and i think one of the reasons fox was so successful all these years is we had many different voices look we don't agree on everything but that but look at all the other voices we have on fox that disagree with us look they lost the media war they being the far left they lost it then they lost the political war because trump was elected president so now they have no choice they can't compete and win hearts and minds they can't so they have to destroy and that's what they're doing and it is, you know, I, I have to tell your audience, and this is, uh, you, why don't you take a drink of water, Hannity? You don't say anything. All right, this is just for your audience. Hannity's the only one, really, taking these people on. Now, other commentators mention it, but everybody's afraid. Everybody's afraid that these people are going to dig up stuff, they're going to fabricate stuff, they're going to attack, 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 and nobody wants to live their life that way. So therefore, these people have been allowed to amass a lot of power. We're talking media matters, color of change, the Bonner Group, George Soros' operation, they've been because nobody will expose them. But Hannity has done it. He started it. So everybody should know that, whether you agree with Sean or not. He's the guy that's putting himself out there to stop this. And, it, and I'm, I'm I, I, right behind Bill, I'm going to tell now. you something. I, I have a regret. I really do. I regret I didn't start it earlier. And I think they've done a very, look, we're all natural competitors. So we're in the same industry. You were in radio, you were in TV, I'm on radio and and TV. And I guess there's just this natural competition. So there's kind of a schism and they kind of use that schism to sort of pick off one person at a time. And ultimately, you're right in this sense. Their agenda is what they could never get done at the ballot box electorally, what they could never get done legislatively. um, Or on television. Or on television. We crushed CNN and MSNBC. Crush them. Well, you want to come All back? Right? I think you should come back. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm at the beach every day having fun. <laughs> what do you want? You want to drag me back into the swamp, Hannity? Is that what you're telling me to do? I, I think you want back in the swamp, and I think you'd love it back in the swamp. Look, I, I know your fans would like you back on, too. And there's not a day that goes by that people don't ask me, you know, how's O'Reilly doing? When is he coming back? Would you would you consider at some date coming back to Fox? I don't know. I mean, I have to get this legal stuff done. I have to get this investigation done. This is where I'm putting my energies. And we have BillOReilly.com. We do a podcast every day, which is really. Are you going to make me kick- pay to watch you? Why do I have to pay to watch you? Why don't you just nah, give you it? You get a freebie. I get but, a free. Um, it's and it, don't give me pay. You get a free book if you sign up. We <laughs> oh, come that's to your cool. house and cut your lawn. Come on. You're like the 11 year old kid that cut the White House uh, yeah, lawn I'll last watch week. Your car. BillOReilly.com. Pre- members you get the podcast every night you're you're gonna get sued now you're gonna get sued for saying that you promised to wash everybody's car i mean that's (laughs) not that's the society we live in um i really regret i do have a regret i think we were at each other's throats a little too much you know that's overdone though because as you said we didn't see each other wait a minute don't you don't you regret not being nicer to me you should have been nicer to me look i i was so busy and so crazy you're making excuses uh, yeah i mean but this is a, a fun fact nobody knows. Hannity and O'Reilly went to a Tom Jones concert oh, together Jesus. in Atlantic City. Oh, God. Tom, you, you, Tom almost had a heart attack <laughs> when he saw us in the front row. All right, we'll take a break. More with Bill O'Reilly. He's got his new book out, Killing England. BillOReilly.com. He's got his Talking Points memo up there every day. We'll see if we can convince him to come back on Fox. Uh, okay, we'll take a break. We'll come back more with Bill O'Reilly uh, when we continue his new book, Killing England. Quick break, right back. We'll continue. You know what's amazing? This is going to be written about by everybody. Hannity and O'Reilly have teamed up to go against leftist fascists that don't want conservatives to speak. Have um, How do you view Trump at this point? And one of the things that does amaze me, he hasn't changed his point of view. We went through the fracas last week over DACA, but almost every speech I hear him 
Givey stays on message with what his campaign promises were. I think Kelly has uh, calmed it down. General Kelly is chief of staff. You don't see the leaks that you saw uh, under uh, the previous uh, chief, uh, Priebus. Um, I think that uh, Donald Trump is starting to understand he's never going to get a fair shake. No matter what he says, it's going to be uh, turned around and used against him. So that he's been a bit more careful, uh, writing his speeches down, not going off script too much. Um, so it all comes down to the tax cut. If he gets the tax cut passed, and this is going to take leadership on his part, then his approval rating will go up 10 points. And then if the economy um, spurs because of the tax cut, he'll get reelected. So that's where it is right now. Yeah. Let me ask you about this book, Killing England. Um, by the way, I was I had thought at one point there was going to be a book, Killing Hannity and Killing Megyn Kelly. I'm glad those books never came out. On a serious note, they've done very well. And I particularly enjoyed this one as I started it this weekend. I, I just got an early copy this weekend. And The Brutal Struggle for American Independence um, apparently at your house, you have all this memorabilia, don't you? Yeah, I have a lot of uh, historical documents that show what kind of uh, men uh, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin really were. The importance of killing England is this. Just today, the Dallas public school system announced it may change the names of schools named after Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and James Madison. This is madness, and Americans need to know who these men really were. They weren't perfect. They were very imperfect. And in Killing England, we tell you who they were. This isn't just a Revolutionary War book. Very personal book. Uh, Jefferson was a very conflicted man. Washington was very moody. Benjamin Franklin was like Hugh Hefner. We do you see what Benjamin Franklin was really like? But what they did for this country to allow this conversation that Hannity and O'Reilly are having right now, what they did and what they sacrificed and how difficult it was is amazing. So when these far left people who, and the end game is this, Sean, they want to rewrite our Constitution. They think that the Constitution is a white supremacist document. That's where all this is going. The knocking out of the statues, the change in the name of the high schools, all of that is going to the Constitution. We need a new constitution because the old one is white supremacist driven. This book, Killing, Eng K Killing England, is the anecdote to that. It will arm you with information and you'll have fun reading it. I think you meant antidote. Well, well, antidote. We what might, did I say? Anecdote? You know, don't I, we'll straighten I don't it out. Well, listen, the last thing is, you're right. They do want to knock out the Constitution. And as imperfect, look, we've all sinned and fallen short, as the good book tells us. Of state allowed me to use my email for work. That is undisputed. It clearly wasn't the best choice. Um, and I take responsibility for that decision. I thought it would be easier to carry just one device for my work and for my personal emails instead of two. iPhone or Android? <laughs> iPhone. Okay, in full disclosure, Blackberry. And a Blackberry. I have a, a, a you know, a, an iPad, a mini, iPad, an iPhone, and a BlackBerry. I believe I have met all of my responsibilities, and the server um, will remain uh, private. In order to be as cooperative as possible, we have turned over the server. They can do whatever they want to with the server. I am confident that I never sent nor received any information that was classified at the time it was sent and received. So that leaves the 100 out of 30,000 emails that Director Comey testified uh, contained classified information. I did not receive anything that was marked as classified. Director Comey said that only three out of 30,000 had anything resembling classified markers. You were the official in charge. Did you wipe the server? What, like with a cloth or something? No. Well, no. We turned over everything that was work-related. Every single thing. I had uh, not sent uh, classified material nor received anything uh, marked classified. Secretary Clinton said she never sent or received any classified information over her private email. Was that true? Our investigation found that there was classified information sent. So it was not true. Right. That I am confident that I never sent nor received any information that was classified at the time it was sent and received. Secretary Clinton said there was nothing marked classified on her emails either sent or received. Was that true? 
That's not true. There were a small number of portion markings on, I think, three of the documents. I never sent um, classified uh, material on my email, and I never received any uh, that was marked classified. Secretary Clinton said I did not email any classified material to anyone on my email. There is no classified material. Was that true? Now, there was classified material emailed. People across the government knew that I used one device. Maybe it was uh, because I am not the most technically capable person and uh, wanted to make it as easy as possible. Secretary Clinton said she used just one device. Was that true? She used multiple devices during the four years uh, of her term as Secretary of State. But we turned over everything that was work-related, every single thing. Personal stuff, we did not. I had no obligation to do so and did not. Secretary Clinton said all work-related emails were returned to the State Department. Was that true? No, we found work-related emails, thousands, that were not returned. All I can tell you is that when my attorneys conducted this exhaustive process, I did not participate. Secretary Clinton said her lawyers read every one of the emails and were overly inclusive. Did her lawyers read the email content individually? No. All right, News Roundup and Information Overload Hour. This is the Sean Hannity Show. I think that Trey Gowdy montage is probably the most damning thing you've ever heard, and it makes you wonder, how did you get away with all of this? We've got new information. Our friends over at Judicial Watch continue their pursuit of truth and and the public's right to know as they look through their Freedom of Information Act request. And what they've got is new information of pay-to-play at the Clinton Foundation and other evidence of other deleted emails. Anyway, newly released emails. How are we still getting newly released emails? And joining us now is Tom Fitton. And uh, Tom, of course, is with Judicial Watch with this information and proof that there is a lot more to the story with Hillary Clinton. What's going on, sir? Hey, thanks, Sean. We're, we've been getting these emails in dribs and drabs over the last two years now. And, you know, Yuma Abedin, Hillary Clinton's top aide, had a separate email account on Hillary Clinton's server. And she was doing the foundation business, her personal business on the server. Well, it turns out there were a bunch of government records there, and we've been getting them. At least 20 new instances of classified information on this system. Uh, the Doug Ban, who ran the Clinton Foundation, was sending uh, favors or asking for favors from the State Department for Clinton Foundation donors. So several new instances of that. Well, and this was Clinton important while, that she didn't turn over. While she was Secretary of State, if you were a donor, you had access. If you were a regular human being, you had no access. In other words, she was basically catering to, and these emails now go into some of the detail of this, catering to those people that donated in some way, shape, matter, or form. Tell us specifically about those examples. Well, there's one example of a, a person associated with a, a group that gave between 10 and $25 million to the Clinton Foundation and paid Clinton personally $2.5 million a year, uh, a Mr. Steve Bing. Uh, one of his associates was trying to get uh, visas for a, for a production crew to Cuba. Mm -hmm. So you give money to the foundation and they make calls to get visas for you. Uh, another donor wanted government appointments for him in Singapore. This guy gave money to her campaign, gave uh, Hillary a speaking fee, and gave uh, about $10,000 or less to the Clinton Foundation. So it wasn't expensive to get favors done from the State Department if you were a supporter of Hillary Clinton. It goes on and on. And on top of that, as I said earlier, you've got these new emails that Mrs. Clinton didn't turn over to the State Department as she effectively swore under oath to doing. So you got to wonder why the Justice Department isn't reinvigorating or reinitiating an investigation into what Mrs. Clinton was up to, whether she lied under oath when she swore that she turned over all the emails. Now there are 600 emails that we found that she didn't turn over. And it, we're, not, we're only getting this because we're suing. It's not like they've been voluntarily disgorged by the State Department and Justice Department. And, and the, we haven't what's important the emails that may be on the Wiener laptop yet. We're still waiting for those. These were all subpoenaed from the get-go. This is not like we should be finding it. Now, what we also discovered and what your Freedom of Information Act request found out was there were numerous additional examples of classified information that was transmitted through unsecure, non-state gov um, accounts of Uma Abedin, from and she's the former deputy chief of staff of Hillary Clinton, as well as instances of these Hillary donors receiving special favors from the State Department. Now the question is: Now that we know that Comey had the fix in, and Comey 
was exonerating her before he ever even interviewed her or the other witnesses in the case. I guess we kind of sort of now got to believe that Jeff Sessions has every right to open this case because I've always been convinced and am to this day that serious, significant crimes were committed, that national security breaches resulted as a matter of this action, and that she obstructed justice in the process. Well, that's exactly right. The problem, of course, now is Jeff Sessions, during his confirmation hearings, promised he'd recuse himself from Clinton email issues. So now it's going to be up to Rod Rosenstein, who's the number two at the, uh, in the Trump Justice Department. It's not the Obama Justice Department. I have to keep on telling myself that, that uh, it would have to make any decision to reopen or reinitiate an investigation. And, you know, there still may be active investigations going on at Hillary Clinton. We still got to be clear on that because, remember, Congress sent a referral to the Justice Department last year asking to investigate whether she told the truth or not. And supposedly the Clinton Foundation was under examination by some U.S. attorneys and FBI agents. They couldn't do much, but they were still looking. Let's we go through some examples. That's going to be done. Well, and we don't know, and we never have gotten any confirmation that we've ever gotten the 33,000 deleted emails about yoga, a wedding, and a funeral, right? Yeah, those are still coming out uh, in uh, to judicial watch in a separate litigation. The Justice Department and the State Department, even under this administration, Sean, are telling us they don't want to get us all of those emails until 2020. <laughs> they slowed down the release, and they're they're it, it's like and, and then at that the point they'll from. say, "Oh, this is old news. Oh, we've been here before," which is a typical tactic. Let me give some of the examples that you have found. And, and you were very clear in saying these are emails we have not seen before after all this time. But in May of 2010, the Clinton Foundation donor and a developer, Eddie Trump, no relation to Donald, wrote to Doug Band. Doug Band worked at the, worked at the foundation. He was a, one of their top officials and a former top aide to Bill Clinton. He forwards a request for help getting the Russian American Foundation involved in a State Department program. He sends the request to Aberdeen asking if you can get this done at a meeting set. Now, you had previously reported that the State Department paid more than $260,000 to the Russian American Foundation for public diplomacy. That would seem like a quid pro quo. That would seem like a kickback. That would seem like pay to play. And then you have an instance in July of 2009, Zachary Schwartz, an associate for donor Steve Bing, contacting again Doug Band, requesting right. help on visas for Cuba for a film production uh, from his crew in, in his entertainment group. Band forwards the request again to Aberdeen, asking her to call Schwartz as soon as possible. Aberdeen said she would. Bing donated between 10 and $25 million to the Clinton Foundation. You got another case in September 2009 when the chairman of a futures brokerage uh, firm, CME Group, and the Clinton Foundation donor, Terrence Duffy, asked Clinton to help arrange government appointments in Singapore and Hong Kong. Clinton forwards the request to Aberdeen, who said she would follow up with his secretary. And we got instance after instance here. Now, what percentage of the then Secretary of State's time was taken up by people that donated to her? Yeah, you have to wonder if they had time to do anything else, given the number of requests that uh, Aberdeen was fielding on behalf of the Clinton Foundation. And you may remember, Mrs. Clinton promised the Clinton Foundation would have nothing to do with the State Department if she became Secretary of State, because both Democrats and Republicans and the president himself, President Obama, was concerned about that. And she promised she'd stay out of it, when in fact, as soon as she got in, uh, the favor gravy chain began. Unbelievable. All right, stay right there. We'll have more Tom Fitton. Actually, Tom, we're going to have to let you go. We'll get to your calls when we come back. We appreciate you being with us. Appreciate the good work you're uh, doing. Also, final half hour of the program, wide open phones from now till the end. Hannity tonight, 10 Eastern on the Fox News Channel. Uh, we do have some news to discuss in the final half hour of the program. We'll get to that. All right, as we continue, Sean Hannity Show, 800 sean You want to be a part of the program. All right, let's get to our busy telephones here. Vanessa, New Mexico. Vanessa, hi. How are you? Glad you called. Thanks for taking my call. It's good to talk to you. I just wanted to reiterate that I don't understand if Jeff Sessions is going to recruit himself, he'll recuse himself, excuse me, um, the next guy in charge of Rosenstein, he's not going to do anything. So who's going to step up and do this? Well, look, at the end of the day, they've got it. You know, if there's equal justice under the law... 
and we don't have, you know, dual application of the law, then it's a no-brainer. She go, she would go to jail under any other circumstances if her name wasn't Clinton. And I know, well, Hannity, when are you going to let it go? I mean, listen, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We could talk about the forgotten men and women in this country. We could talk about Lindsey Graham's new plan to send health care back to the states. It's from what I've been discussing all weekend with senators and congressmen. It's about one vote short in the Senate and would likely pass in the House. So we're trying to get that across the finish line. We need the tax cuts across the finish line. Now, the, the problem with the 15 percent is then once you get to 15, you can't use the reconciliation process. Had a lot of talk with leadership in the House this weekend. They want to get it done, but it's going to be a 20 percent because Mitch McConnell is stubborn and refuses to get rid of the supermajority when he could. It's so, so, he's, I don't want to change the traditions of the Senate. Okay, if you don't want to change the traditions, go to a simple majority, because that's the way it started. I'm an originalist in that sense. All right, let's get to our phones. Uh, Joanne is in Pittsburgh, PA. They need jobs in Pittsburgh. What's happening, Joanne? How are you? Glad you called. Hey, Sean, thanks so much for everything you do for us. We appreciate it. Um, I am done with President Trump at this point, to be quite honest. He is disappointing me and everyone else in my group who has voted for him. He is losing the female vote. The middle class. Tell me women. why. I want to know why. You know, give me specifics and tell me, and I'll tell you if you're right or if I disagree or or if I agree. First off, when he became president, he should have just purged the entire administration of any Obama holdover, which he did not do. Second of all, he is getting rid of all of the people who got him to where he is. Third, he's surrounding himself with people like McMaster's. Even Tillerson's becoming wishy-washy. The only one who doesn't get the credit they deserve is Nikki Haley. She's the one. She has been good. I agree. She she needs a shout out for Nikki Haley. All right. Put aside last week's DACA distraction and the president um, corrected it. And and I talked to a lot of people inside the White House. Anyway, so put aside that where where has he changed in the things? In other words, what he promised versus where his position is now. Where has he changed? Well, he kept saying that he's going to build this wall. And then he turns around and he gets wishy-washy on and he's like, well, we're going to have to take parts but, but and we'll do that later. But I already said that. I mean, but he has reiterated no deal if he doesn't get his wall. And they've, but that's, they've but, actually already started repairing the parts of the wall that are up that were in, in other words, refortifying it. The wall is a necessity. It's the equivalent of read my lips, in my view. All right, 26 after the hour as we continue. Hot songs, hot country, 106.5. <laughs> uh, no, as my buddy's big and rich, it's... The latest from their new album, Did It For The Party. I can't, I still call it an album because I'm so outdated and old. And this, the climbing single is California. Where are you on the charts? It just uh, came out, right? Uh, it's been out. It's been out through the summer. It's doing great, man. It's, you guys uh, never sounded, but be- you never sounded better. And I've been a you. huge fan of you guys for how many years have we known each other? So, I think since right since the beginning, honestly. But you Big know? Big Kenny has never, I've never met him. He never hangs with us. We've been out till five or six in the morning. Yes, we have. We've been tearing it up a little bit. We have done that. And you cannot repeat these <laughs> stories. <laughs> but it's all in good fun. Of course. But the worst part is if you hang out with John Rich, you got to shoot Crown Royal. Well, at least once, you know. No, no, no. You don't do it. You don't let you anybody off the hook once. The, <laughs> the passing out double rounds of Crown everywhere you go. I you know, know, right? Seriously. Yeah. Big Kenny, how are you? I, I'm. It's an I'm honor fantastic. to meet you. Fantastic! It's I'm a, good to be here, brother. I know this you're a liberal, great. but it's a, it's it's exciting to meet you because I've been a fan of your music all these years. Kenny's you actually an independent. Liberal. I'm messing with him. Kenny's a straight up and he's, he's <laughs> like an actual met, independent. What do you guys? Because you're singing partners, you got to defend them. I can't let you beat up on my friend. I'm not beating. No, I'm a fan of Big Kenny. I love Big Kenny. <laughs> um, how did you guys get together? Well, we met in Nashville. Kenny's Kenny's from Virginia. And I'm from Texas, and we met in Nashville in 1999. Uh, a girl that was working for Fender Guitars knew Kenny, and she knew me, and she said, she was, you guys got to meet up and, and, and hang out. And so we did, and I said, I don't know if this is going to work. And Kenny was like, I, I said, it's kind of like two bird dogs sniffing each other. Are you going to fight? <laughs> yeah. Are you going to hunt? 
<laughs> and we decided, all right, we'll try to write a song together. So we wrote one song, and the next day we wrote another one, and then another, and then another. And that has turned into now 18 years of us writing songs together and making music. How are you liking it, Ken? I mean, do you get – the road is hard. You're it's on the like buses, you're traveling. like a bee, man. Yeah, you Ain't love it, huh? Nobody be happier than me. All right. I'm just glad glad to be here, man. It's been a been an amazing ride that we've been on, and to be able to continue to write songs that – tell you stories of the things that inspire you in your life and put them into music and put them out with your brother and, and to go out here and tour the world like we have and to have as much fun every time we hit that stage. It's awesome. It's the best part of it. It's like the old Jackson Brown song. You know, let me play just a little bit longer. You want your show to go on a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, which is the best part. Now, you guys all created the Music Mafia. Oh, right, yeah. over the years. Spandalism of music without prejudice. Yeah, oh, I, yeah. Tr- I tried to steal yeah. it at 5 in the morning from, <laughs> from your brother over there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was a great movement in Nashville because at – Prior to us having this little group called the Music Mafia, which was Gretchen Wilson and Big and Rich and Cowboy Troy and all these really interesting artists, you know, the industry competes so hard against each other. They would actually, the artists felt like they were competing against each other, too. Artists don't compete. Artists are supposed to hang out, make songs, have a good time together, together and, yeah. and applaud for each other when they do well. And so that was the whole premise of the I'm Music Mafia. sure it's Mafia. not radio and TV. It's the same, th- same thing in radio yeah, and same TV. Thing there. Yeah, but you know, off camera, you guys are all rooting for each other and want to see your no, brother do well. No, no, no. They want me dead. Half the people <laughs> in my business definitely want me dead. They hope. I'm starting my 23rd year of Fox, my 30th year on the radio. I just got, I'm getting inducted into the Radio Hall of Fame. Congratulations. Congratulations. Now, all that a rock star. Well, all that means is you're old and you should probably retire. Retire now while you still can. Well, but I hear you're doing young. the MMA now, so you can. Uh, yeah, I am. Back. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I do it now five days a week. Yeah, serious, uh, Krav Maga, Kempo, Jiu Jitsu, yeah. boxing. Yeah, and I could well, really hurt you now. Yeah. Well, you want me at five in the morning next time? I walk by the, the <laughs> couch and my kid will jump off of it on my back. He grabs me around the yeah. neck at seven years old and says, "Can he Daddy, choke you out? Tap when you can't take it." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, how disappointing was the McGregor fight? Oh, that was so disappointing. Uh, all I want now is now that they went in and they did a boxing match, now I want them to get into the octagon and see how they, yeah. they battle well, it. That would be cool, wouldn't it? Turn the tables a little bit there. That would be 15, cool. 15 seconds is over. So over. If, you, if you could get in the ring with any other uh, uh, host out there in the news world, who would you like to take on, Sean Hannity? <laughs> I'd take on the world like you do, brother. Uh, oh, you want to take them all at once? I'll okay. take them all at once. All right, here's a question for Big Kenny. Um, so I, came, I got really close to your brother here. And I never met you until today, which drives me nuts. I used to, how many times have I asked you, what's Big Kenny like? You know, yeah. what's Big Kenny like? Is he as political as you? Because this guy l- loves politics. Oh, yeah. And he, he likes to, after a couple of shots of Crown, he wants to take the contrarian position and see if I have the ability to, you know, <laughs> debate with him. And you he's do that got that now and again on the bus. You do it on the now but, but he's got this ability, even after 12 shots, crown, he's going to look exactly the way he did it after, before, before the 12 shots. And the rest of us are like slinging along like that. <laughs> That's practice. where I get you. Practice, practice. It, 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 yeah. <laughs> Do you drink on stage and tell the truth? Do I drink on stage? Yeah. Um, absolutely. I would. Uh, typically, before we go on stage, we'll yeah. always, you know, we warm have a up drink. a little bit and we have a, have yeah. a little toast of crown, you know. Because it's a out party there. out there. You want, everyone course, wants absolutely. that fun. Well, in absolutely. every show, Sean, for over a thousand concerts in a row without missing one, we played our song, The Eighth of November, which we wrote about a I Vietnam I love that song. My yeah. fav- one and, of my favorite songs. And we invite veterans in active duty on stage, and we do a shot with the entire audience. So, yeah, we have a little, a little it, shot. You have a show. lot of fun. That is – that and what's the name of the religious song that you all write? And, and I remember the water coming oh, down. Holy water. Holy, holy water. water. Um, yeah. yeah. I love that song. Thanks, man. Like, you guys – here's what you capture for me with country music. Country music that's really good, a really good artist – in the course of a concert, course of a CD, takes me on an emotional ride. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to be partying up here, and I'm going to be thinking about life down here, sure. and I'm going to get serious here. There You're you in go. love here. You broke up down here. And then you end with Save a Horse, Ride a Cowboy. And then you end with Save a Horse. <laughs> well, this, this new album, that's the way you're going to feel. When you listen it's to exactly it from beginning like to end. Well, it's going to take you on a hell of a ride. That's, what, that's, to me, all the great artists do that for me. And, and I've, as I said, I've been a fan all these years and a big ca- fan of country music. Can you believe there's like one little baby country station in New York? You go down to Nashville, you go down anywhere in the South. I lived in Atlanta. I lived in 
in Huntsville, Alabama. You can yeah, hear the accent. Yeah, we got more than one little baby country station. We need dozens of country dozens. stations up but here tell in you, New they, York City. They know country music here because walking down the sidewalk, man, there's people rolling down their windows going, hey, Big yeah. Rich. Yeah. It's pretty cool in Manhattan. <laughs> well, it's, it's sort it's of like a huge audience coming here. to your Big city. sales up here in New York City. Oh, everybody knows yeah. who you are. Did you like him on The Apprentice? Oh, golly, man. He's I beg, sharp. I beg Trump to pick him. I owe it Is all to it Sean was? Hannity. I donated, didn't I? I <laughs> yes, did. you did. Oh, I you did. gave a big one, yeah. For St. Uh, Jude's. For St. Jude's Children's Hospital. Y'all raised yeah. a lot yeah. of cash for St. Jude's. Who Saint knew Jude? I was, was hanging good. out with the president the whole time? You didn't know. What do you He's think good of that? good people. He's good. Is that not, his? Nice guy. He's, John not, Rich, John Rich, why should you be the celebrity apprentice? I mean, I mean, it was so crazy to be across the table from him for like two solid months. I was mm-hmm. in New York doing that show, and I remember when I actually won Celebrity Apprentice, and the confetti is falling out of the ceiling. Right, live TV. Donald Trump leans over to me and kind of in my ear, and he goes, "You know, I'm thinking about running for president." He did, did not. And I swear he did. <laughs> Ask him; he'll say, "Yeah." And I, he said, "What do you think? You think I should do it?" I said, "Absolutely, yeah. go for it, man." He goes, "Okay." Do you agree with me, people? I've known him for decades. Do you agree with me, people? Do not know or understand who he really is. I'd say there's a good chance of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think. Uh, I, but can I be totally honest? No, be, I think he's, he's torpedoes he's, the truth, brother. He's his own smokescreen a lot of times to who he really is because because of, of the crazy stuff he throws around on Twitter. I, it drives me nuts because I go, <laughs> why are you saying that or why are you doing that? Talk about you know I don't want to know what you're thinking all the time. He does not every thought has to go out. No, I've said that, that to him. I said, do we have yeah. to hear every thought at four in the morning? But I, but I've seen him be a really big hearted guy to a lot oh, of people. People have no idea, and that's the frustrating thing at times because the left now is just they. Here's my thing: you guys travel all over the country, and you know we got 50 million Americans out of uh, in poverty on food stamps, 94 million out of the labor force. You know what? Those are the good people that want to go see your shows, Mm -hmm. buy a nice house, safe neighborhood, get a decent car, send their kids to a safe school, go to Disney maybe when the kids are five Mm -hmm. and a vacation every year. And they and they make the country great. Sure. People your father as a preacher used to talk about. That's right. Yeah. there's a lot. You know, those are the people we sing to all the time. You know, and I, I think one thing about music and politics, the great thing about music is you don't have to talk about politics at all. You come to a Big and Rich show, and you just hear Big and Rich music, and Ma'am. those statements are made when you do the 8th of November or you, you sing a song like uh, Save a Horse, Ride a Cowboy, and let everybody just escape everything for about yeah. 20 minutes, you know? Is there anything more rewarding than watching, Garth once said this, watching an audience sing your words back at you? That's anything? the best. It's the best, I mean, right? That, that, that's just the best. I mean— you know, I, I liken it to growing up as a kid in church. You know, just here, I used to love, that was one of the things that made me love music so much, just hearing all the voices around. Now, our church is probably a little different than the one that I grew up in. Honky Tonk Church. Yeah, our Honky Tonk Church is, but it's still just people getting together and all singing together, and making a joyful noise together. There's just nothing better than that. Yeah. And it really unites everyone in a great way. Yeah. Um, where did you grow up? I forgot. Culpeper, Virginia. I'm Virginia. Seventh generation farm boy. Are you, did you grow up on a farm? Yes, sir. What'd yes, you grow? Sir. Still take care of it. What'd you grow? Culpeper, Virginia. Oh, we still we grow uh, raise cattle. Wow. Raise cattle. What, Cattle's you, been a consistency through all of it, but we've raised all sorts of crops. Cattle. All you got to do is feed them. You don't of. really do anything, right? Oh. Oh. Yeah, Kenny, Kenny just actually went home and weaned. Yeah, How many cows weaned, did you weaned? Weaned their cows. I weaned a hundred, hundred and five. It's hard. Yeah, yeah that's I a mean, lot. it's just it's a lot of ground to cover when you're yeah. moving them, and they don't always act just exactly the way you want them to, or they're not always <laughs> birthed exactly the way you want. Sounds them like to children. Be, Sounds like adults in New stuff. York. Yeah. All right. So you walk. I play. Come into your city a little bit. Album out. Did it for the party in California. We just played a part of uh, y'all headed out on tour. How many cities? Oh, God, we've been, I guess, about 70 or so cities so far this year, and we've got another. You guys think you're being noticed because you're, you know, Big Rich and and (laughs) Big Big Kenny and John Rich here. No, it's not it. Big and Rich. It's because you, the way you dress, nobody in New York dresses like you two. <laughs> We're trying to you set a new trend here, you man. You kind of stand it. out, man. It's not yeah. like, you know, what the is Somebody's going on with those two? some style around here. Yeah, we really do, too. cowboy style. That's what I want to be, a, we're like, a we're rock like, star, so I could dress like you guys. We're like the well, modern we got a song day. on here that says, congratulations, you're a rock star. Sean Hannity. <laughs> Sean <laughs> Big and Rich, Sean Hannity Show. It's called California, the new single. We'll take a break. We'll come back. 
And uh, we'll continue. Hannity tonight, 10 Eastern, Fox News, as we go straight ahead. All right, we're going to wrap things up for today. So the movie that we have, you know, it got Best Picture in Toronto this weekend. It's the first movie. I'm the executive producer, Let There Be Light. It's out October 27th. We're going to be telling you what theaters we are debuting the film. But we have a contest if you want to see it early. Let There Be Light Movie dot com slash contest. All right, Hannity tonight, 10 Eastern. We'll have the latest on the Republican agenda. The president at the U.N., the danger of North Korea, the Emmys getting political. 10 Eastern on Fox. See you back here tomorrow. Thanks for being with us. See you tonight at 10.